Hello everyone, today we talked about the Roman-Barbarian relation in ancient literature, especially the late antique one, and the general moral um, impact that the political and military events uh, connected with this relation uh, had on, uh, on the world as a whole, right? This is not the first video in which we stress the still universally um, perceived order right by both the romans and the barbarians and i use the term barbarians as you know because of course they weren't just um it wasn't just a single ethnicity right um everything was uh seen just dichotomically in the past in that way it was a center of order that every culture identified um say within at least its core values uh, myth of the origins, etc. And then there was a practical reality that had to do with the, uh, the the actual center of power that could not quite be seen as it's done today in a populistic sense, like, you know, the greater the enemy uh, in a um, force and therefore, like, this is the evil guy that wants to take over the world. Um, we live in a fourth estate society that doesn't have any meaning in this regard, especially from a historical point of view. Um, as the problem that is inherent fundamentally in, in tradition, in Catholicism, in what essentially, in fact, these peoples all believe, right, aside from the various uh, doctrinal issues, Arianism, what we call, you see, the, we distinguish Catholicism from Arianism, but the terms um, are not uh, comparable on the same level, right, they're not one in opposition on the other, first of all, but they stress different aspects um, within that same uh, universal view. Um, the uh, the problem, which is always dual, and that often has confused, I think, in the millennia, the same uh, regarding the same meaning of, of Christianity, uh, but also the one of what we call paganism, mostly as a reaction to to Christianity than actual knowledge about what is, of course, improperly but still improperly called, but still very differently um, believed at the time. Uh, Pagans, paganism. Um, and this has to do with the obvious acceptation that if you are essentially the weaker side, you do not really have excuses in front of God. Meaning that every single earthly power derives from the heavenly one. There can't be someone whose accomplishments are basically just the fruit of a mistake or an evil force. There was for this reason an heretical um, say current as a world of, of enormous proportions admittedly that is the dualistic one um, that identified two different forces in the uniform, universe and presented in this sense with, with enormous theological issues uh, if you look at Gnosticism, at Manichaeism etc and as you know many of the think about Augustine you know, some of the greatest uh, Catholic thinkers of course were uh, and mostly all of them at the time, considering how strong was, were these other currents, were perfectly aware of, right? And they lived in constant uh, conflict, but relation with. Um, and equally, so f this this is something that immediately appears in the relation that, for example, the same Germanic peoples that today we mostly discuss had with the same empire. Right today, we want to look at the question: Did really the barbarians want to destroy the empire? Um, let's say, in the sense that, in which it's been em overly emphasized, I would say in, in the 18th, the 19th century, no. Right. So historiographically, in relative terms, this is not true. But you cannot eliminate from that also the, um, let's say, the the option that everybody had. Otherwise, this would not be an ethical. Um, discourse. It wouldn't make any sense even scientifically speaking. Of course, both the Romans and the barbarians um, were sinners. They committed evil uh, and at the same time they were also virtuous and they committed good. Right? Uh, and r What was the virtue? I made specifically a video about this and regarding properly the um, the sort of the, the common military creed that these peoples had. Every one in traditional cultures had a place on the road. It was, of course, understood that, say, in the imperial military, the federati were, um, for 
longest time, right, in, in, the, in Roman history, um, subordinated to the Romans, but for very specific metaphysical reasons that could not be simply denied by these peoples, who realized, probably would have said, yes, these Romans have basically uh, earned, because they have established their age of order by God's will. They are truly the, the, great, the, the great empire, and truly, and I mean, lots of it is the oldest, um, say, followers surely have uh, an idea of what I'm talking about here, but throughout the entire migration here in the early Middle Ages, even beyond, the not just the Romanity, but the centrality of this empire was never denied by anyone, right? The same Holy Roman Empire is nothing but that profound metaphysical continuation. This has nothing to do with what you think about this being the Roman Empire, not being the Roman Empire. We're talking about what they actually believed and why, right? And this passage is often skipped because uh, the Holy Roman Empire is often, in fact, just mocked in a anti-ancien regime uh, concept. So it, of course, doesn't even enter into the depths of what happened after, like the, say, the, con the brutal contraction um, of the same empire territorially uh, at the end of antiquity. And so, what, what did this mean, right, for these peoples? What did this mean, for example, for these people uh, to? To, to get Christianized, right, to accept Christianity, and why, right, we often tell the story again, the terrible uh, ancien regime, the terrible old order, the Christians converted anyone because they were a bunch of nuts, um, and for some reason, right, this thing spread uh, autonomously and was accepted by everyone at the end of the day, and also in that, there is surely a, a double face, right, this event was not worldly virtues at all, Right, but there is a specific meaning at the end of the day that especially the elites and of all these, of the Romano barbarian ones, had um, together with the church and those who basically flowed even into it and had still a voice spiritually from so many universally different backgrounds that ended up to be encompassed, uh, even say not, not just within the Roman borders, but think about places like Ireland or you know. Others that literally decided, as Christianity was eventually um, spread like, right, to accept Christianity autonomously, right, that they were much less, uh, to say the least, right, disproportionately, so by magnitudinal scale, people were forced into Christianity than the ones that uh, basically accepted it. And also, this happened at, in fact, um, at, at different levels. Um, than the sort of blind replacement that we think normally occurs with this kind of conversions. Not at all. The same Catholic creed, which, by the way, was the official name of, of, of the church, right, and of the same uh, ecumenic empire such, um, entailed this because it, in, it included uh, the, the globe in this. It was not... Uh, the, the empire was never considered in this sense, especially by actual deterrent moral force, in a Clausewitzian sense, to um, to have stopped somewhere, or that this had to do just with the places that the Romans had directly occupied, um, etc. So it's a complex issue. Today I will try to make it simple, because um, I realize that, uh, as for many other historical things, there is no contemporary guidance to this anywhere in pop culture, and sometimes I'm here just basically telling this thing alone. Um, but um, we must be aware of the duality of of men, per se, right? Not the and, and the responsibility of men in this, which is a profoundly different, uh, let's say, uh, thing from uh, dualistic heresy, from Gnosticism, that I will not digress on, but that commits some of the most atrocious. Um, in, say, but if if it weren't if it were just for the co incoherence of the the moral and scientific principle of the same, but that must make us realize how important this wall uh, was considered, uh, and how much the barbarian invasions, of course, presented anyone uh, with the moral issue of what is this to go like, right? What what is that we are actually doing from both sides and what is the order within this, right? This happens within the heart of man. It doesn't happen just between 
uh, say, a, a territory or another, right? The barbaricum or civilization. This is a, a much deeper and moral and spiritual concept because all the rest, let's say, um, it, say, uh, isolating from life is just a, um, a problem, right? Something that we are still responsible for because of original sin um, and the fall of mankind and, and, and the, uh, the materialization of the world as we know it, with, with its limits, etc. But always remember that the proper name is Catholic, is Catholon, right, in Greek. Um, and so when we think about today's difference between Catholicism and Orthodoxy and whatever, th this doesn't mean anything. Right? It's just a convention of for things that happen in later times. At the time, there couldn't be just but a Catholic world that um, others were essentially countering because they wanted it to fall apart uh, and the Catholic world was by default orthodox in a, in a doctrinal sense right? not in the sense that um, the the Christian world cannot change um, and it cannot adapt to the new moral temper but also that it in, in Catholicism had that we most identify just for the, the papal issue we can say but that has a profound meaning as well. Today we don't talk about the Gregorian reforms, all this stuff. I have an entire playlist about that. You can't appreciate it. Um, you know, um, and we'll, of course, keep discussing it. But realizing, again, w what um, also, in fact, the later or, say, Western Eastern Church d division, even assuming that we can't speak of such a thing, just like for the empire, by the way, many people really think to have been two empires at some point. That's technically not true. Nobody would have ever believed that. Um, but just the, um, of course, the degeneration of mankind uh, creating this fracture, an ever greater division uh, away from the, uh, the the golden age, the age of heroes, the age of, of gods, right, of, of, go of god men, basically. Uh, and um, the, um, the different, let's say, the conventional meaning of, of most banners that you see today... Uh, in a way that is not even remotely compared, uh, comparable to what was actually believed at the time. Um, so there are lots of things we could um, start from and observe uh, along the way. For example, it is sort of common knowledge that the easing of Gothic pressure on Constantinople, in a general sense, in the way that the same Byzantines carried it out, um, with the settlement but since the beginning, like with, after Adrianople with the settlement of the gods, specifically in Illyricum, also coincided with the exposure of the Pars Occidentis to their threat. This is what routinely um, the Eastern Romans tried and succeeded also in doing. Right? They felt an enormous pressure both on themselves uh, and far from actually being in a much better position than the West, they simply won the struggle right, by sending these populations uh, West. They did so with the so-called Visigoths, with the Ostrogoths, with the Longobards. The pattern basically was always the same. Yes, it, it, it with the Longobards as well, this is something I, I say routinely uh, in my videos about uh, the post-Gothic War period, um, there was always an agreement of some sort, even if we are not explicitly informed of this. Um, and of course, this of course reflected the, the particular situation in the West um, by the late 4th century. Of course, there were already significant differences between the two halves regarding to the same federati policy, but so the thing had worked, um, as you know, up to the death of Stilicho, right? Specifically what we call the Visigoths, that just for the record, were called like this later, when uh, Italian authors like Boethius, etc., were referring to the gods, like the gods that in that sense were settled in the Italian peninsula as the gods, and so those in the Iberian Peninsula in, in Gaul were, were the West gods, right? They were called historiographically like that, and then only by reflection, those the, the Italian gods were now the Ostrogoths, because they were the eastern ones. And so, you know, there the, was the split between the Turbingi, the Grotungi, there was some sort of overlap in there before they settled um, within the, the Roman Empire. But 
we know what peoples we're talking about. We'll come back uh, discussing them. I made uh, years ago a series about both. Um, so if you're interested, you can check that out. Now, Stilicho, that as you know was essentially the Generalissimo of the West for Emperor Honorius, um, defeated multiple times the, the Visigoths, that we will call in fact like this for simplicity, um, to the point of literally deciding whether they could be annihilated or not. right? And he expressly decided not to do so because they were a very useful political pawn they could use within the empire, throwing it back um, say to, to the east and or mm, threatening the same um, empire, say the, the same power of, of Ravenna for um, Stilicho's personal gains. We will never know to which extent, you know, that Stilicho for this reason was um, essentially declared uh, as a traitor and beheaded, um, which he, yeah, uh, underwent with great sense of great honor, like as as a, as a Roman military man. Um, but that also exposed um, hopelessly Italy to the uh, gods of Alaric, that by the way had suffered um, the massacre of their women and children at the hands of the same uh, Romans, the imperial order, and that instead plundered Rome in an actually very gentle way, or a very organized, tidy. Uh, fashion and essentially prohibiting the, the greatest uh, violence, etc., but as a sort of compensation for what had been objectively a very high uh, tribute of blood that the gods had paid in the service of the Roman arms. The, the thing is, of course, messier than it sounds overall, the sack of Rome was um, a huge deal in the literature of the time. We recognize that, of course, it didn't change much. Rome wouldn't fundamentally um, decline, uh, particularly as a city because of this. Um, things kept working satisfactorily up to the 6th century. And there, it was paradoxically the Byzantines that were true foreigners to the Italian peninsula at that point that uh, caused the problem. In an otherwise very cooperative Goth- Romano-Gothic uh, peninsula. But aside from this, there, w- what we, we notice here is, is the reaction to con- contemporary reaction to um, the wars against these um, barbarians. Of course, we can't trace this reaction just from the Roman side because it was the literate one and um, especially at this point was already a Christian one Um, and uh, as such having also a very particular view and uh, sort of moral inclination like in the observation of these phenomena that probably would have differed from say other say the average um, the average subject uh, and or by elements say of the army etc and that unfortunately we do not much about of course pretty much nothing uh, is known from from the barbarian side and this has nothing to do with people's paranoia today of things such as you know they 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 hid history we will never know the truth but no we know pretty much what happened right it's just that the way eventually um you know these great names also fathers of the church etc would have in western literature left us with a very specific um say vision Right um, terminology, expression, etc. That, in my opinion, is also very, very telling. Right, it's not wrong. It's not really hiding something. But it, it, it's expressing, however, um, the, the say, this, describing the events from the lens of a specific background that has its own lenses. It had its own colors. Let's say. Uh, and therefore highlighted one point that we desperately need because we would be all we should all be extremely thankful for anything we have at that point but that of course is um uh it's just like looking at the kaleidoscope and say stopping to just one view we we see a lot of stuff we see the beauty of it but we should also understand that um as the same thing that we see still uh, there are so many facets and many aspects and lights and, and shades that we, should, we need to consider. Um, it's um, definitely uh, obvious that um, the Roman world was not cheering for the barbarians as a war, 
right? This is yet another thing that we should consider, especially before the settlement of these peoples. Um, and so the fair complete to some degree could not be reversed or had not been reversed up to a certain point. We'll see it later. Um, we can easily see that uh, at the victory of Polencia um, in the Western Alps in 403 uh, by the, the Romans over the Goths, right? So these are, uh, this is one of Stilicus' victory for Honorius uh, against the barbarians. Well, um, there, there was definitely a celebration with equal warmth, albeit with different accents, by both the pagan Claudian and the Christian Prudentius, which is, I think, quite relevant. The sources are respectively the De Bello Gothico and Contra Simmacum, which uh, tells you also what was probably the, uh, even the, the doctrinary clash, um, say, that works as, as a background, as a context for these statements as well, because the barbarians, of course, entered in it. It's just looking at today's, say, wars and looking at essentially the factions that also quite incoherently like um, take position politically um, in domestic and foreign policy etc and people have the, the illusion slash delusion that they are essentially understanding what, what's going on and pretending that their side must be uh, certified by a certain extraction a certain political view etc of course the same mess was occurring at the time, except these sources are also some of the most uh, coherent as a whole, because of course it was a world of elites. Um, so, celebration was joined at that point uh, by both uh, in the, the pagan and Christian world within the, the proper empire um, against uh, he whom in, uh, in a brief time, only seven years, not even, would have uh, uh, essentially stabbed the sacred soil of the herbs, right, um, under his heel. Now, such animosity against the barbarians here, as the barbarians, that rem remember, was essentially a standard figure, even in the religion of the barbarians, right, when it say it took to define who was the en the chaotic enemy who did not bring order and was threatening in fact the, the divine one the same uh, the same awareness of the sacred etc there was always a barbarian I mean everybody knows about this in say Norse Germanic mythology um, the the models are always the same right a barbarian is bigger and dumber um, and physically materially stronger but uh, the hero is always like uh, a, sp a spiritual one that manages to outmatch with wisdom the threat posed by the barbarian, right? So the question, given this quite um, archetypal as truly institutionally uh, recognized uh, religious, political, cultural model at the time, what was the actual meaning, right, what the actual feeling towards the barbarian, right, um, did these barbarians, uh, in the first place, um, was a, a cause or a, or a, an effect of the Roman decline, right, and how much did these factors that even coexisted interplay with one another, in the sense, what was that the Romans really were doing to preserve their own empire. The Goth, for example, that is this figure which is quite difficult, as you know, to, to frame, right? They were the most important of the barbarian groups uh, that at this point uh, afflicted the empire was essentially the, the largest threat, the one that from uh, the Danube, right? And for a, a very extensive amount of, of land threatened um, the empire, but that exactly for this vastness is, you know, quite difficultly connectable as a wall with the otherwise plausible um, a Scandinavian origin of at least a, a, a primitive originary nucleus, 
right? I, we talked extensively about the gods. We know that there are some peoples, like the Longobards, that have quite certainly um, a, a Scandinavian origin, even from a political point. I mean, they, 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 the original nucleus can be traced historically to literally come from there. This was quite common for any other Germanic people, except the Goths were such a big group and most of their history was fundamentally written just by the Romans later on in the 6th century, especially to flatter the elites of these populations that had formed in a way that was surely dramatically different from the ones that left Scandinavian, that had in fact collected um, a great amount, especially of Iranians, um, from the uh, say the Eastern European um, kingdom, like the Bosphoran kingdom, etc., that they had founded, um, was a much more of a, sort of, you could even say the Germans were a thing and the Goths were another thing. Right, for how the latter, how important the latter really was, and you know that the Goth, in this sense, is is so relevant because um, it embodies the barbarian a bit by uh, default, especially this sort of semi-civilized one, after all, in part because they stayed for longer, uh, literally within the and they were the first ones to settle as an entire confederacy um, or a group of of that scale within the Roman boundaries, they were, they were the ones who had also much um, sort of um, uh, nurtured elites, both by the Romans and later by the Huns. So they were a people that could be dealt with at some point, even with greater ease than, than others, at some other point, and or at least it was normalized, it was pushed in this forced, uh, forced integration into the Roman system. And, um, well, there would be really a lot to tell about the gods, um, and I, I would say this, that as far as the skepticism goes in historiography, I'm definitely from the side of those that think that these were largely Germanic groups, after all, and that, yes, um, that can mean alone more things than merely a genetic uh, indication, but um, if one really looks at the histories, the spaces, the times, etc., more or less, even if we do not have a direct proof, that is the case. But the, in the in the, co in the in the case of the gods, that's definitely the most difficult one. Even though, of course, the god became exactly through this late antique literature for the Westerners later on in the medievals and modern era, etc. The also matter of cultural legacy of symbolism. Those who had crushed the empire. In fact, on the basis of this literature, rather than what actually happened. Um, everybody began to sort of um, um, idealize, if you want, this category as such, and so um, at some point seeing things that um, really not even the top scholars really are normally capable of assessing and uh, Therefore, you know, especially for this time that is notoriously underdocumented to the extreme. Um, but in fact, uh, that's the problem. Pop culture tends to, uh, say, patronize history without even having read it, which is uh, pretty fascinating, right? But what emerges from, of course, this Roman Roman Christian literature of the fifth century is something. It is evenly connected to a broader ideology that, of course, we should never think like even if the gods had written it in a peer in an era like this or in any other telling truth had much to do with the with with historical objectivity and of course was actually a very intelligent, a smart, and functional way of putting the emphasis of one aspect uh, of the story to be functional to uh, the say, the, the, uh, the, the emphasis on another aspect of another topic. Of course, they were still intertwined, but again, also this sort of um, fourth estate or paranoia for, you know, reading history and not even understanding that these sources are functional to something, so pretending that somebody is constantly lying to you and preventing you from knowing the truth, well, it's the same way, of course, uh, throughout all ages, lesser people went down because of their own irreparable stupidity and incapacity, which is, in fact, what, however, also the world system gets damaged by uh, overall. Um, and what emerges from this literature is um, 
regarding the barbarians and in particular the gods um, this dark desire for destruction right this is not even of course it's, it's directed to the a to, to the order right to the age of order that the empire has established uh, in Augustan times with all the implications the divine implications of the story especially also for the Christians that of course had Christ born um, in that period uh, and um, the the point is that these barbarians as barbarians as any barbarian does of course he is Catholic he wants essentially the destruction of the system wants to tear uh, down the hierarchy wants to tear tear down the rules wants essentially to lower the standards of civilization because of his own uh, personal envy and frustration and lack of success. Naturally, in the case of the barbarian peoples that ev eventually invaded, settled, uh, in uh, and in part dissolved, at least the, the statal system of the Roman Empire, in spite of the, the desperate attempt to salvage as much of it, and we're talking mostly of the Germans because, say, the Huns could have never ruled, right, a sanitary contact. Like, the, the Germans were already Romanized by half of a millennium of, if anything, uh, osmosis with, with Rome at the frontiers. Um, and so would prove themselves capable enough. But in, in general, you see um, that the, um, the objective was not the one to destroy, in fact, and that was especially an achievement, an accomplishment. These peoples, for all the reasons we will see now, were moving, right? And they had not been moving before. And of course, um, it's difficult to quantitatively measure the moral pressure put, say, by the, um, the this domino effect with the Hanuk migration, for example. It surely was a huge deal, right? But also the opportunity that the same empire presented when invaded so um, nothing was so positive as some sir if you want to say that you know these peoples were just moving because they, they saw their own empires the natural harbor where they could save themselves and were positive towards it they were peaceful no right they, they were invaders in arms and they knew perfectly well that they were conquering somebody else's land but of course, to anybody's um, moral standards at the time, the Romans included, this was perfectly fine, and it's objectively difficult not to see that, because the concept being that, as we were saying before, if you have power and you succeed, well, you can't do that uh, without God's green light reward, right? So, um, it was all what all these peoples, without any single exception, were about, right? Um, the, um, say, there are some differences in theory, um, especially with Christianization, and so what was the meaning of the empire, etc. But nobody would uh, argue that, say, the Christian Roman Empire kept expanding as much as it could with a blessing, of course, of the church, and that, in fact, um, Catholicism has nothing to do with the, the lack of an expansion of power and of the empire, etc. Um, the... Um, uh, let's say the original intention of Atalf, who succeeded the the secretor of Rome, that is Alaric, um, that is to overthrow the Roman Empire to replace it with a, with a Gothic one, a, an intention uh, which was attributed to not not without tendentionness by that dull eager of Augustinian motives was Paul Orosius soon transform itself, uh, according to the same author, into a sort of synthesizing or at least conciliatory will between Romania and Gothia, right? Um, so, in a way, that would have been pretty much the same that gave origin to Latin Germanic culture in the Romano-Barbarian monarchies, and that is at the base of the new medieval civilization. Nothing would have been possible um, without either of the two uh, elements, uh, also because you know that would equate it to some sort of uh, you know disaster uh, of some kind that would have destroyed basically any vestige of civilization, which did not happen, right? So you see, when we look at this um, concept, like like the one expressed by uh, expressed by Orosius about Atalf, what what should we believe? Well, I think that there is of course a 
um, um, a negative bias by that specific alter. But if you analyze the, the mere thought of it all, right, the fact that these peoples were definitely not obeying to imperial authority because they believed they were endowed with one exactly because they were succeeding so if they could right they they would do it uh, at their risk because they had to fight through it so it was never an easy decision nor one that they did lightheartedly or just saying well you know we're, we're just the best we will always win but let's say in fact passing from this state after all subjection that the germans in this case specifically had been for for hundreds of years of queer sense uh, uh, at least um to the same you know soldiers of rome to the same um uh, takers uh, of rome in the case of alaric and even those who could come to rule over the romans which was seen as a huge responsibility not just because they were doing it in on behalf of the empire but because they were entering in in possession of much greater assets than the ones they had ever seen before and so they had also to cope with essentially the same identical problems that the romans had historically gone through right uh, so this tension between tradition and modernity how do you run a state how how do you succeed what kind of means do you use right is the spiritual um side enough or do you have to put some patches the Christianization of these peoples goes um, along the same pattern, right? The entire problem here is that the empire was failing, right? This is what, say, if you read the same Gospels, the entire point of it all is that the Christ um, is the only way to heaven because earthly princes have failed in even at the top of their achievement, like the Augustan one, to, um, but in, in in human history to actually save themselves and to actually transfigure the world um, at least to the degree that um, that empire could keep uh, replicating that level of power, right? In fact, you know that even the Christian apologists were praising certain passages of the N.A., etc., because they they were looking at the new Phoebus, right, uh, prophesied um, in, uh, by Virgil in, in the eternal cycle of of universal regeneration, salvation, etc. The same Christ, right? So, at this point in history, uh, even though it's obvious that individuals like Orosius, etc., were partisans, just like the Germans could have been, and so likely what Adolf thought was in part true, right? That these Germans were not really coming, thinking that they uh, they were let's say at least ideally below the the standard of transfiguring the roman empire into a gothic one right uh, however they would have uh termed it but they surely bought in the same identical mechanism for which they had been respecting and serving rome up to that point again in, into uh, like settling the empire serving its armies recognizing imperial overlordship in all this stuff right so orosius of course explains this by observing how eventually this um, primigenial sort of uh, need to overthrow Rome um, even by those who had literally sacked Rome would uh, negotiate like a, a, a synchrosis between the Romans and the gods right and decided of course for their settlement uh, within the same Roman Empire and even participating to its defense later, etc. But uh, of course, as seeing uh, seeing that, that that piece of it as let's say their own share, their own due, which obviously was and this surely will have been painful for the same people, realizing that it was nothing in comparison of the enormity of the empire. That uh, by the fifth century was even to. Uh, by the uh, end of the 5th century was still capable of end, well, the 60s. Majorana's times was able to defeat the Visigoths in Spain from the same Italy. So um, if it hadn't been for the Vandals there, things would have gone differently. But of course, all these peoples also hated each other remarkably. So you can't even talk about a Germanic coin, let's say. I made a video about the Alans there, showing how, for example, that steppe people turned out to be much friendlier towards the 
primal meaning of the imperial Catholic tradition um, to literally support Rome against this uh, Germanic federati that they had initially entered the Roman territory with and that um, instead turned out to be uh, disliked by the islands uh, who preferred to obtain some, some sort of elite uh, strategic functions within the same um, settlement of federati in Gaul, etc. So you have um, a lot of things going on politically. And, of course, even Christian authors at this point were writing, that's what I was saying concretely before, for other purposes. They weren't interested in these stories, right? At least they were, to some extent, to make example, etc. But it was not their primal uh, interest of making a strategic analysis of how, I don't know, the Visigoths or, or the Alans interacted in Gaul. Um, and that's why I was saying, for remember that we see one part of the story, but then there is a lot uh, going on, which is um, uniquely congruent in this case with what we just said, right? But um, must be uh, derived from other sources, right? There is also, uh, of course, an important doctrinal theological aspect here that is the fact, as we have seen multiple occasions, that notoriously most of the, those barbarians converted to Christianity was not Catholic, um, or at least they had a version of their Christological understanding which fundamentally deprived Christ of the divine nature uh, for reasons that also I can't digress today but it had to do on but it had to do in my opinion with um, something very similar to what happened in the Protestant um, in in Protestant times as a matter of fact I mean the the, the fact that um, Paradoxically, uh, the greatness of God wanted, uh, say, was among these people. You, because you would think that these were just coming from, say, from being closer to the primitive understanding of Indo-European uh, Catholic imperiality and all this stuff. They would have a Apollonian, uh, victorious view of the world. But this was not the case, right? Just like Christianity had sort of um, brought this gloomy veil on, on the Mediterranean by realizing that emperors failed and so that there was a standard, a divine standard was evidently not quite met. The Byzantines maintained a bit more that sort of ideal, but also they ended up crystallizing themselves. Um, also, the northerners, um, the peoples of the Barbaricum, were quite pessimistic uh, about uh, human capacity. This is something you can read even in the in the Norse sagas, etc. I mean, the the idea that somebody can save oneself by himself was, um, generally speaking, not bold, right? Already, the think about the storming of the Asgard, the some of the gods will die. That nobody knows how it's gonna end. So it's actually even a much gloomier view than the one that um, the second come of Christ that must remember happen after Satan has come to rule on earth right it has to be defeated by Christ so there is there the same uh, the same possibility like um, that um, of course works may have not been enough right um, the Germans were up to a fight they would end up in the Valhalla and they would uh, hope however only to be as powerful as this army of heroes um, for Odin eventually to, to, to prevail in the Ragnarok, but um, it was everything was extremely uh, clear, right? So at least from the later traditions, maybe at this time, we don't know exactly what the Germans thought, but we, we see from this same um, from the same Arianism that there was something along that pattern, right? So almost the nullification of the individual in order to stress the necessity of discipline that we're so desperately chasing after because they didn't have those statal structures um, to compete with, in fact, the, the bigger empire. There are actually something very similar to what happened in the, um, in the 16th, in the 17th century among the same populations um, compared, say, to, to the Spanish Empire, to the Habsburgs, etc. But um, this is, in my opinion crucial because it, um, it it of course highlights that these peoples wanted 
to represent themselves uh, as something different. After all, it's say unlikely that a fourth, fifth century Goth had uh, any solid understanding of the Christian uh, implications in theology, about the same Christian literature, etc. Even when they were Christians, and they could be both at the same time. I mean, again, it was always the same religion technically, just there was a different um, uh, mode, like a civilizational attitude towards what you had to be as such. Being Aryan was just a choice that surely reflected part of what these peoples believed regarding their heroes and so Christ, because you know that's the point, right? It's there you have essentially Odin uh, in the same way, but uh, in a Christian sense, in a more human fashion, and in fact the same Aryanism stresses that part as if the guy was in fact not was the hero of the situation, but not um, provided really with um, the divine uh, nature. In other words, denying the full divinity of Jesus Christ and denying, in fact, that, that um, uh, working capacity, a bit like the Protestants would have done later, uh, in the capacity of Christ to actually win himself, right? It, it's sa somewhat how strange that also in today's theology we hear this great scholars to discuss, you know, the re recovery should come back to the Christian positive thing, if, because it all starts from going backwards in this sense uh, to the origins. But, um, you know, as conservatives, as if it was cosplaying a fashion, and they, they still present you the story that, Christ was sort of vindicated by God as opposed to him actually succeeding in saving himself. And that's why he was the son of man and the son of God. Um, something that was incredibly clear to, um, to Christians in, in the period that we're looking at. But again, the most important thing here, dividing on such a crucial issue that, as you know, would be event would bring to the condemnation of Arianism in the very first council, Ecumenic Council of the Church at Nicaea, and so a bit the foundation of that um, same orthodoxy, that same Byzantine Empire, if you want, um, through this firm stand against um, this heresy, um, is again a way to say we are another thing. We're, we're another thing compared to the Roman Empire as well, right? And, uh, and so you can see there, a bit like in Protestantism, a bit of a disorientation towards the, the mere concept, let's say, of the, um, the civil need for order under a same ruler, right? And a universal institution. Um, something that eventually would not say this is a tendency that happens historically with the dimming of the sacred in the heart of man. Um, bear in mind that the same, uh, that how instrumentalized these theories were is that the same Germanic peoples at this point, especially the Goths, were heavily stratified, right? They weren't like the, with the average freeman being so powerful and mighty and thinking what they want. They were already heavily under these elites. Um, that, however, and also because they were split, likely were, um, and because they came, they stem from a background of otherwise, in fact, freedom as far as the level, the elite level was conceiving that, that is to say, doing whatever you like on other people under you, as long as somebody doesn't, somebody bigger doesn't do it with you, right? So this was a, a very important way to um, affirm their own individual independence. However, at the detriment of a greater order like the one that the empire really was, right? So it would be obvious in front of the most Catholic individuals, both pagan and Christian, because let's stress, pagan, uh, let's say Catholicism is also a pagan thing, uh, if not the pagan thing, in uh, at least in this Apollonian, in this context in the European sense. Of course, an, an atrocious affront, not just to I mean, to religion, but as such, to civilization as a whole, right? So this, specifically, this Catholic-Aryan divide uh, may have been the des uh, decisive in the affirmation of the unilateral vision of the barbarians as a destructive force of the empire. 
right? Even if this vision found a fundamental corrective by Augustine's theology of history, um, not less that, than by Jerome's theology of penance, in the idea of the providentiality of the disasters that befell the empire, right? And remember that Luther was a big fan of St. Paul and St. Augustine, and for very specific reasons, because these authors had been the ones who had reinforced dramatically the uh, even more sort of the, the spiritual dimension to the point of quasi-heresy, right? I mean, Augustine had been a, a Manichaean himself. Um, uh, Paul, as you know, is, is the guy who, say, did not redraw Christianity, but of course made it accessible to to Rome and from a a background that was differentiating it in part from what, what was the Christian church under the same St. Peter that notoriously tried to have uh, St. Paul whacked in, in, when they were in Rome. So much of the Romans had to um, give Paul, of Tarsus, that was a Roman citizen, by the way, um, a guard, like a, some security. In any case, as you know, they, they found, they met the same faith, albeit uh, St. Paul was beheaded because he was a, he was a Roman citizen. Um, but um, let's say they are communicated as St. Peter and St. Paul, of course, in the most, in the holiest Romanity that, of course, represents the only empire that the earth can ever have. Um, but this, of course, say especially Augustine, was quite, um, say, I've used this term not in the psychiatric sense, but it, borderline in terms of uh, heterodox. Regarding this, uh, I mean, it is a, a right concept, uh, traditionally, catholically, like the, the sense of the fact that it is ultimately the spirit that makes it all. It's just like with faith. Faith immediately, if you have faith, you will immediately take that step through action and work, right? But it starts from faith. And, of course, there is a debate, which is the same one, actually, between, the, let's say, the, the Catholic and the Protestants, but also others in history, that is, is there a lag in time between the two? That is to say, in the moment in which you, you achieve faith, do things really materialize immediately? Uh, or uh, you can just be a, a, a best Christian and being a total failure of a person. This is not so easy, even if you read the Gospels, to, 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 to assume simply. Also because Christ, again, was specifically highlighting the, the contrast between, of course, what happened on earth and what happened in heaven, but as a, a reminder that, of course, there is a spiritual dimension within you and an outer one. Um, also a political one that you have to take into consideration and that is up to you because you're entrusted with that so you have to show that you have faith etc so it's an incredibly complicated and intricate um, uh, theological issue uh, I mean in outline it's pretty simple after all but this is you know the one about which you know we killed each other happily doing confessional wars for centuries so you may want to notice how it was still rooted in a sense, at the time. St. Jerome was more about, as we said, the, the idea, of course, that everything that happens to you negatively is, of course, a blessing because uh, you, you will be tested. You will have be given a chance to see more, right? To wake up, to have a wake-up call. Uh, and this fits the role of providence. And so even how this providence operates in interest of time and action relations is somehow complicated, it's a bit the same point as before. But of course there were attempts of mediation because at the end of the day it was rightfully believed that while there was an order of merit between the Romans and the barbarians, at the same time there was a need to keep the wall united. And this is also an incredibly relevant uh, issue. Uh, I would say overall, of course, the Roman Empire was never repristinated, so there was definitely a decline, but the Middle Ages especially show, still in Catholic tradition across Europe, how um, the immediate uh, descendants of both the Romans and the Germans, they were 
together in this. Uh, in fact, the same people as uh, descendants um, succeeded in maintaining that unity for to, to some good extent, at least compared to the modern age, right? And evidently even more the, the contemporary one. So Christian mediation and meditation, especially in its eschatological aspect, did not at all ex abrupto come into associate barbaric danger, the collapse of the empire and the end of the world. Um, because um, this was not yet uh, happened. Uh, of course, we know how it ended and we know that, of course, moments of crisis um, can always uh, project sort of a bleak picture of, of the future. But let's say one thing is the collapse of a civilization that would happen for many reasons, by the way, not just uh, the barbarians, um, is um, something that impacts the way we look at that, especially afterwards, right? But at the time, especially in a, in a world that still holds together, basically, again, the 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 full the true collapse of late antiquity is something that happens much later than this and in a time in which the same Romano-Germanic kingdoms had as still theoretically part of the Roman Empire were trying to keep things together uh, themselves uh, were were suffering um, there was much literature however to remind that of course uh, this could this moment of crisis could be the one of uh, preluding right the the end time the eschatological expectation founded on the book of Daniel and the apocalypse and linked to the theme of the senescence of the world had found of course a uh, varied expression already in the themes of Cyprian Tertullian Hippolytus and in the mid third century when the Gothic threat um, constituted, after all, just a distant warning, uh, and the Roman army was a force considered invincible despite everything. Um, Commodian, that had uh, lived, in fact, between the 3rd and 4th century, so living to see the actually the reaffirmation of the empire after the 3rd century crisis, and saw a substantial stabilization that in his own lifetime was not giving signs of of the buckler, right? Hand linked, however, the seventh persecution to the eruption of the gods beyond the Danube, right? This guy was not to leave to see Adrianople, but um, as premature as this observation was, it was also prophetic, given that that's exactly what would happen. Naturally, Adrianople in itself did not really doom the empire. Like, uh, there are other things that really did so to a much greater complex extent, mostly what the same Romans were doing. Um, and uh, but, but it was definitely an important watershed, right? The entrance, properly, this um, so autonomous people within the empire boundaries, so very different from the barbarians that up to that point had been simply taken, diluted in the empire, settled as colonists, as uh, records, etc. Uh, and so Romanized and civilized. This is something that even after Adrianople, the same Theodosian imperial ideology was driving, say, the, the driving the, the greatest uh, pride of, importantly enough, in that Catholic universal uh, idea of, of course, the um, reason, right, wisdom, rather, bringing like the world, like ordering the world and transforming the barbarian into a Roman, which was the greatest ambition the Romans in this sense had. Redemption, transfiguration through divine power, or everyone, right? So something that, for example, I don't know, uh, the Nazis forgot um, during the 20th century and just looking at brutal destructive force. Of course, there is a dimension of sacrifice, of battle, of clash, um, but the ultimate uh, uh, victory is to spiritually redeem your enemy. So even necessarily, of course, to kill him in combat, etc. But if he understands that you're superior to him, 
like fitting the order, the hierarchy, the traditional one of the estates of the castes, right? That all these peoples also believed in, including the, the barbarians. Now, the fact um, is that from then on, um, the tenacious tradition that saw in the barbarians a shocking presence in the future history of Rome turned towards two distinct outcomes. When one was, um, we could define it as a post Constantinian one. I made a video about Ambrose specifically um, transforming, essentially give, giving the Roman Empire fully a Christian conscience, also in the patriotic identity, right, uh, of um, of the Christians, right. The idea that it, it was that that was in Ambrose's time a Christian empire, it was fully uh, legitimate to use violence in order to defend Christendom to preserve it and remember that at that time that was intended as the globe that Rome had uh, had now controlled fully and so what was seen as, as the barbarian invasions of course was just a reduction of what had already been achieved and so it had to be restored as well right so in other words Ambrose had inherited the anti-barbaric spirit of the Quirites Right. The Christians had become fully Roman, and so they um, they fully uh, interacted in the sort of secular dimension that, of course, they had also uh, taken control of to an important extent on behalf of the same empire. The other view was instead more interior, say, more markedly mystical, eschatological, and in there, the barbarian invasions constituted the price of the ancient and recent sins of Rome, right? And on whose basis there was also those who, like uh, Salvian of Marseille in the mid-5th century, wouldn't hesitate to raise the voice of the painful Roman province, of this faithful daughter of the orbs that had been so poorly repaid by her mother, and to contrast the Roman corruption and cynicism, uh, which Christianization had remedied very little, with the rough virtue and natural wisdom of the barbarians, arriving at with the apology of those who prefer to take refuge with the barbarians rather than continue to bear the yoke of the weak and oppressive imperial bureaucratism. And if you're interested in the latter, it's Salvian's uh, De Gubernazione Dei, uh, the fifth part. Um, the, the interesting aspect of this is, of course, the the interest of time, because as we were just saying, eventually the, the empire did shrink dramatically, and um, uh, this was territorially evident when where the barbarians had come to rule. So, of course, um, in tradition, uh, the just think about the Germans uh, th believing that the Asgard had to be stormed at some point because it had been even though it, it was made of gold and by the gods, the latter had um, used for their construction the Nibelungs, uh, in this sense intended as uh, a lesser race. So there would be some sort of uh, dwarfs, etc. But it, this is from the Aesir perspective. So actually, as, as you know, the, the Nibelungs were also the earthly heroes, right? Uh, that end badly, but that's the, the darkness and the sort of lack of self-salvation uh, that we we're talking about before that beautifully fits here because the Germanic hero is always um, eventually dying in in uh, uh, in ways that of course are uh, the price that he pays for that minimal mistake that however uh, a divine race cannot afford to have to 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 commit um, and so the Christians were thinking the same thing, and the Romans were thinking the same thing, right? You had to be perfect in order to hold the entire globe and to save yourself, because uh, you would have been God yourself. Instead, this crisis was uh, in front of everybody's eyes, and it could not be explained, but also through the sense of Rome. Because again, nobody can claim in tradition, well, but that guy did that to me. Where were you? Where this thing was happening? Why didn't you defend yourself? Why didn't? Why weren't you stronger? Why weren't you? Why wouldn't you be able to convince, after all, the other of the worthiness, uh, the righteousness of your cause? 
um, this was the, the price to pay. There was a confusion within uh, the entire system, right? The barbarian one, the Roman one. And Salvian of Marseille was being a provoker by saying, look, here in essentially what would be, say, Marseille, of course, a very Roman city that would remain so, for, say, uh, on the coast, etc. But it was the area in which the Burgundians, the Ostrogoths, had extended their power coastally, or from, respectively, from the interland and coastally. And the idea was, of course, that this province that once had had in Arles was just um, next to it the same um, uh, prefector of the Gauls, right? Uh, the rule of some barbarians right, in our also relatively frontier area, because as you know, the Burgundians, yes, they, they went on living as a, as a kingdom on Rome, but they had basically been uh, the same Nibelungs, right? The, the defeated people. Uh, that in the story in the medieval epos looks at the Nibelo, uh, at the Hans, right, Attila in Vienna, etc. But it was likely a memory of uh, Etzius, Hannic mercenaries that destroyed and deported uh, through the Roman army the Burgundians from the Middle Rhine to um, Sepaldia, in fact, this, this other region. And, and the sense is that, um, of course, Rome had failed in defending, anyway, these communities, right? Had failed in maintaining, that this case, the, the control over Gaul. It had failed, essentially, to uh, concretely uh, mm, uh, just occupy territorially this region and to maintain that system of order and internal uh, harmony that had uh, legendarily characterized the golden age. So um, the, the question posed by Salvian is, but you know, aren't the barbarians better to some degree, at least the one that allows them to rule in this limited space? Um, and can people find a better start here than in the Roman Empire that was becoming ever less, especially in the West, powerful and that especially was um, uh, very sclerotic as far as the oligarchy, like controlled everything and the rest of the people just working for them. I mean, this was not really different from what was happening elsewhere um, and uh, these were actually some of the best places to live still in the world, but uh, so the barbaric was not definitely a better place to live in. But the sense is that, after all, uh, the barbarians, in their positive accomplishment, had demonstrated that, to, to that extent of the, this territory, this, this, vic this conquest was um, concerned, that they had had a virtue on their own, a natural wisdom. After all, Caesar, Tactics, etc., that were very aware, by the way, of the concept of end time. Um, had um, admired, like a bit like the primitive savage, right? Uh, look at these peoples. It's like how we were at some point before we took over. So of course the barbarians do not make it to to achieve what Rome had achieved, but in at that point in which Rome had fallen itself, they evidently seemed as a model of virtue of some sort, or at least of preservation of certain values. Now. Nowadays, we see something very similar, like we think that some more authoritarian regimes, etc., just because, I don't know, they maintain a greater ethnic compactness, but sometimes it's not even true. I mean, look at Russia, I mean, it's full of Muslims. Um, but the, the point um, being, at least on the outer side, right, there are people who say, well, but these people reject gender ideology and critical race theory and all this thing, so they must be better than us. They aren't, as a matter of fact. They've never been, and they're never going to be. Actually, they're in a much deeper crisis than our own. Right? Again, the, the abyss that remains in the early Middle Ages um, between southern and northern Europe is striking, right? even in the areas that uh, fell to the, say, um, to the Germans. Let's say the, the most developed ones are definitely the, um, the, the ones in the south, the ones that uh, witness a greater Roman continuity. Um, there can be also 
another uh, capacity that is the one to keep activating power that is quite fascinating. For example, in the case of the Franks, right? Definitely northern Gaul was not a better place to live than southern Gaul, even though in the south it was less of a power. It was the Merovingians in the north that managed to, at least for a while, maintain um, basically the greatest power in the in the west and even um, uh, and even to actually strip I made a video about this the gods of the uh, let's say the the guidance of Romano-Germanic Europe this I think is very important again the Merovingians eventually undergo a crisis in the second half of the uh, sixth century like pretty much everyone around but still I mean northern Gaul Southern goal slightly different. It takes time before things come back to an important level of, say, um, accomplishment. There is always, at that point, a Romanity that remains, uh, especially with the Merovingians, in a dynastic sense with the local Gallo-Roman Church, but properly the context with Rome, the the, evangel uh, the evangelic missions, right? Even with the Anglo-Saxons that were sponsored um, by fact by the same Merovingians across the channel, well. At that point, it's truly a Romano-Germanic reality. And that's arguably that one, that this modern traditional synthesis that allows these societies to take over. Because also, I don't know, in that sense, uh, Scandinavia was, was more traditional if we consider, uh, let's say, the, the, the primitive sense of how to reachieve, I don't know... Uh, uh, military capacity through the, the evocation of the Dionysian, the the more warlike. But what did they achieve concretely? Very few. So that it's it's an illusion to pretend that. Say this is the problem of civilization, and we see it well in the West or in any other time in which we, there is a crisis of some sort. That of course, as more spoiled, gentrified we are, and the more defeatistic we are, even though we are we have all the means to work. Think about the support to Ukraine. Right? It's not that the West had ever a, an actual economical or material military support in providing Ukraine with adequate assistance just to stop the Russians from moving forward and so mating, bailing out. But we are like, what, maybe this, no, well, let me wait because here I want, it's just like an internal thing, I, not prioritizing, whatever. And so things eventually deteriorate. This is a very good example of the degeneration of humanity. It's not that we're going to live in a better world just because, say, somebody gets taken over, right? Aside from, of course, the, the dramatic strategic and political macroscopical interest, of course, that the West has in, you know, Ukrainian independence. But also, uh, in the, the mere fact that there is a lack of vision, right? This is the problem that we're not uh, seeing that the enemy is dumber than we think, that the 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 way the only way we can lose is just entering a sort of superstitious mode in which things have to go bad, and we do not make want to make the fort. But civilization also has the means to make things work, which is um, what, in fact, uh, otherwise the history of mankind would have not disproven. Some would say, well, but if you, humanity degenerated. Uh, what about civilization that increased? Definitely. But civilization, in fact, is provided with a spiritual pneuma. And so there are ups and downs in this regard. And we are actually meant catholically to invert the, the degeneration of mankind. Right? Uh, we put patches, we use technology, and so um, a, a decline can be just, can be spiritual. But as we were saying before, um, if this is the case, this also reflects itself in material culture. And right now it is, right? But it is because of lack of spirit, not because, let's say, when it came around here, these resources were not there for us to just remain fat and rich. Uh, they were always here, but we had to work in order to make them work the way we did, because, of course, spirit is superior to matter. And also why that's why communism is, is our... Is, the religion of the lesser people also historically if you look at where it spread uh, in the world so it, it's not really um, I think a matter of opinion whether um, certain sort of measures are are out here but this was a bit the 
the manifest problem that um, in antiquity was much more evident in my opinion. I mean, the, these authors are really discussing it, whereas we are not discussing it. We have been fed with this myth that after all things improve. Yes, they do, but if somebody does it, right, if there are the, the good reasons and chances, what these ancient authors were shocked by was the fact that they thought to have lived in the actually successful spiritual reality. Um, and of course they had committed some mistakes that we have committed ourselves but they knew what the divine connection was today we don't, that's the main difference today we have removed God these people instead uh, were incredibly more aware of course of the direct damage that would derive from a generalized crisis in their world right, due to the lack of a spiritual training because spiritual training was in that sense the the same one that had brought a less developed people like the, the barbarian ones to just succeed uh, against um, a superior enemy that uniquely had proven from a spiritual, a spiritual level to have failed in that superiority. Um, so when we look at Ambrose and Salvian, we, we're looking um, rather than at two opposite poles at two sides of the same coin. You have the person who accepts that a civilization is in crisis, the other that actually doesn't. Or And there is a, there can be, even here, it's always double thread, there can be a good um, and bad side to both. Right? You can still think that, after all, if, even if all these bad things happen, civilization, you must think positively if you want to fix the thing. Others said, we, the, we, yes, that's true, but if we do not say if our thinking positive is just an illusion because we are so habituated to, um, to understand what's actually positive, and we don't understand what our problems are, we are sort of doomed, right? And we must understand what's the, the right balance there. So the fear of the barbarians, the hatred and contempt for them must have been mixed at the time in public opinion with considerations, of course, of the faults and errors of Rome. Therefore, with a certain palynological disposition towards the uh, gentis with the long hair and the robes of fur, after all, you know, the only ones left to defend the Roman name when the populace uh, Romanus would probably bore it, had instead abandoned their weapons. This is another aspect that we have uh, investigated to some extent in other videos, and we'll have to prepotently come back on soon, hopefully, is the fact, of course, that um, the barbarians had been serving Rome basically ever since Rome existed, right? There had always been more foreigners in the Roman army than actual Romans. Um, and the obvious reason was that the Romans were at the top and these guys were at the bottom. Now, Part of the reason simply why the the Federati took over is that they, they were Federati, they had been settled um, through the hospitality system to actually replace the regional armies, as we were saying before, like the Visigoths, for example, as a, as a people. It did not exist until the Romans created it uh, as the army of Illyricum. They did not exist, it wasn't such a thing like a Rex. Uh, they, that was created in Alaric by the Romans. Who had also nurtured this chief, uh, this, this chieftains uh, in Constantinople, etc. So it was an artificial mechanism. It was still product of Romanization in many ways. And so uh, the Romans had grown so confident that, after all, uh, Rome had this uh, universally redeeming, absolutely redeeming capacity that somebody could fight in their stead, um, or that they could just pour resources without understanding the, say, the civic uh, duty to participate. Of course, it was difficult to understand that while the third century crisis had happened, um, the civil wars had deteriorated Roman society, people were not really free. Um, in a, they were not citizens, they were subjects now, right? So, like pretty much in all the rest of the world, right? Whereas, at some point, uh, especially the, the center of the empire had been literally an empire because it was a people that had ruled over many others in virtue of its own moral superiority. 
and now this superiority had been diluted right uh, into the empire it had exhausted itself and there were these other populations that were a bit rough a bit savage but they actually knew how to fight they knew um, how to be in that sense politically cohesive how to uh, survive out there in the wild um, they knew how to fight how to train themselves for that and they had been used right they had been drawn from uh, the outer frontiers of the empire since the early third century BC. I made a video about, uh, I mean, AD. I made a video about the Simacari, about this when essentially all Roman citizens had been becoming to subjects because just there was nobody within the empire who would, would, would fight for obtaining the citizenship, except for the Lyrians, maybe the Lyrian emperors. Um, they were mostly for Mesia, to tell truth, not even. But in any case, um, they needed fresh records from across the frontier. And given that across the frontier, as we will see now, life was traumatically um, terrible, to, to say the least. Uh, these people were just much more definitely spirit and spiritually aware of what it meant to fight. Just sometimes even out of sheer desperation. I mean, there is no other reason why you live in a tribe actually at the fringes of civilization. Right, it's it's the same reason why. Uh, after all, the empire had say, was not taken over by these cultures; was taken over by uh, their force, which is a slightly different thing. Right? They these peoples became much more Roman, including in language and customs and administration, etc. Than than the Romans became German in a cultural sense. I made a video that observes how juridically this happened in the early Middle Ages, but not, uh, but just in name. Uh, and of course, the, there is a, a massive Romance continuity, and the, the, the most important Romano-Germanic kingdoms are not, uh, well, the most important Germanic kingdoms, to put it in this way, are not in in, 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 in Central Europe, they are in, in Romance Europe. There is a bit of a, uh, self-evident continuity there. Um, there would be, of course, even more to, to discuss, but these are things I repeated many times throughout the years. Now, I I this is understandable, by the way, precisely because the barbaric phenomenon seen as a wall was also broken down in practice into a series of cases you know, different sides, like if, if one Nazio attacked Rome, another defended it, right? And, and the thing was changing, was switching, was, was changing. The Gothic Alaric that had violated the herbs was opposed by the Vandal Stilico, a proud defender of the same. The Visigoths themselves were good allies of the Romans uh, before that, but also after against Attila's Hans, just as the Longobards would later be Justinian's allies against the Ostrogoths that had been uh, sent to rule over Roman Italy by the same by the same Constantinople. And that even as Arians, you know, after Theodoric killed uh, Odoacre, like, you know, they went to Rome uh, paying respects to the Roman Pope. So, you understand how there is no much of a counterposition when it comes to the practice of how to handle the world. Right? You must be motivated by some kind of ideology, but at the same time you must be aware of the feasibility of certain of certain issues. I mean here we look at pretty devastating stories of entire peoples at some point annihilated or risking uh, that and that changed dramatically. Um, also regarding to their origin to the place where they were standing at times literally this is the reason why today no one believes in the concept of the say barbaric invasion at least in the sense that this expression had in the historiography of the 18th and the 19th century I made it at least there, there is always something true to that like a 50 percent of that is correct especially the brutal part the violent part the fact that this was not, uh, first of all, a walk in the park for anyone involved. It was not a happy moment for anyone involved. 
uh, and the result was definitely a minus, right? That, that there was a, a, a collapse, right? And there is no doubt that the um, the Germans too that were fleeing uh, much great, let's say, great threats, and of course the the Roman Empire to some extent represented a safe heaven, not just a competitor or someone that you had to be legitimately wary of because they would risk to, to, to enslave you, to sell you, like, like it happened before Adrianople, etc. So um, everybody was pretty, you know, uh, pretty wary of the, the dramatic consequences of this critical uh, moment. Um, so this was, if anything, a long, exhausting process of infil infiltration and of mutual forcing, assimilation, and repulsion. Uh, source, the, the resources were, were a few, um, and definitely somebody had to go in order to fit in, in order to drastically you know, lose in terms of life quality, uh, as the world system was, the, was definitely suffering dramatic strains. So, distinguishing Romania and Gothia uh, can make sense merely on a theoretical and historiographical level, right? There were regions, as we all know, in you know, in Europe that still today are named after the Romans and the Goths, uh, toponymically. Uh, because of course the, the some boundaries remained even with uh, within this either the same Roma, uh, roman or germanic area um uh, not just uh, at the frontier of two s rigidly separated areas of europe think about i don't know gothia in, in south western gaul uh that indicated merely the fact that that was a land remaining in the hands of the visigoths ruling in the barian peninsula or think about Romagna uh, in northern Italy, that was the see of the Exarchate of Ravenna, and that the Longobards considered as that the land of the Romans. Um, at Similia, right? Um, but uh, let's say in the space of a time, especially the 5th to 6th century, as in the blood that flowed in the veins of its protagonists, what matters, in fact, is rather the new synthesis from which the new civilization would arise. In a hell of a civilization, if we pick medieval standards that were surely disordered compared to the rigid Roman unity and order, but that we're still aware of that and we're still trying to catch up before at some point we said that the ancien regime that was essentially this it was it was a fraud, and in part because it had uh, failed itself, so this is not to say again the, the world definitely ages. But um, the, say the relevant aspect of this, of course, being the, the fact that today we denied completely the values that were at the basis of that. Uh, and in part, this was for reorienting what was, in part, that also the, the potential of the individual that is always divine in kind as long as it's alive. But that also has grown so fast that has depleted further these concepts to a level of refusal, rejection of any idea of sacredness. And so we are in a crisis now because this is still the long-term process of a sort of bulimic dysfunction, right? For which we try to preserve civilization rightfully, but we do it without wanting to understand what's Let's say, well, what, what's the, the only way you can found a new age of order? Uh, this is not an age of chaos. It's not an age of barbarians, right? Uh, you can argue that you need blood to run to some extent, yes. Uh, and I think it, it does, if, if you look at the, the, f the second, uh, I mean, the two world wars in general, there is a, um, an, uh, an obvious moral, say, drive that brought the world to be framed in a certain way, in spite of its problems, uh, that after all did hold some moral standard, 
um, then there will be the 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 old writers in my you know audience that will say but not because you know uh, he was right in all the let's skip this fact because it's just a populistic delusion to pretend that a nationalist socialist movement uh, <laughs> you know just by definition so stating two radically anti-traditional ideologies could succeed and in fact according to tradition only winners uh, are winners um, it's not how you, you must win in order to achieve something and you know look at what happened in World War the second um, there, there are very specific reasons so this is not a very uh, this is not a mystery like it, it's a mystery only if you or, or a sort of scam or a fraud only if you want to believe that but it, that's not correct historically morally politically uh, alternatives can be worse to some extent we will see where we go with this but definitely um, we are confused and we were from a, quite a long time now the as a consequence in general the dichotomy remember Hitler said this Hitler said quite explicitly that um, he was happy if his uh, movement was seen as one of barbarians it's not that different from Kaiser Wilhelm II saying that the German soldiers had to to be Hans literally because they um, they had to spread terror in the same way and they literally were looking for that sort of um, Hannic origins in the Germanic world from the migration era uh, in the same way and this these are the words of two de gravely defeated people in their own ideologies remember that right um, it's difficult to think exactly that the barbarians won in a in a general sense again the entire system in absolute terms collapsed so in relative terms they succeeded there is no doubt in some in, in great part of it um, but the result for the wall in which they were was, was not really desirable uh, it was not even their fault I mean technically this is how the Romans themselves dragged them down the with them also those who had sort of conquered them uh, because the Empire had collapsed itself um, due to internal strife etc so the Germans came to fill the gap but they they sort of got trapped but in the same dynamic but it's obvious with that, that even the dichotomy that I adopted here um, speaking of barbarians and barbarians against Rome is exclusively to the extent that it serves the need to articulate the discussion right otherwise it's illusory and more than instrumentally and theoretically illusory however the fear and animosity towards those barbarians who even if only in a certain sense and up to a certain point defended them as federati was nevertheless justified by the looming and continuous stress of other peoples those who pressed beyond the so-called say the frontier so in this way uh, it's different but still very similar to those who fought and cultivated in the fields on the side of the same frontier right um, this is another aspect that perspectively is often forgotten the Romans had a fairly good idea of course where they stood uh, and they legitimately didn't have too much uh, concerns about the stability of their empire from in terms of threats coming from the outer side the problem though is that they didn't quite know how far the outer side was nor what could come out of it uh, I mean um, we will see this now I mean the, 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 there's a great fear that had smoldered for a long time in Roman hearts fueled by the same memory of the glories of their homeland every great hero is just like again what the Germans thought uh, had a counterpart and was risking to be annihilated um, the Romans were more Apollonian into this even Furius Camillus shone with pure light because he was opposed to the dark hour of the Gallic profanation 
Scipio Africanus had tamed danger coming from those same lands from which in the mid-5th century the unpredictable nemesis of Geyseric's fleets would arrive, we're talking about Africa, Carthage. Um, the glory of Gaius Marius was linked to the nightmare of the Cimbri and the Teutonists. The distant signs of the coming storm had not failed, as we have seen, to darken the horizon of Roman invincibility, and the frontier, albeit was by no means a continuous line of fortification, but rather constituted largely a fluid and open border, characterized uh, rather from the communication routes and from the defensive installations, was there to indicate a margin of civilization, to mark a distinction between the safe and the insecure, between the cultivated fields and the forest, or the moor or the desert, between a human or manly dimension um, uh, in a rational uh, life, in another unknown, right, perceived as semi-feral and semi-intelligible. I think this is particularly important uh, from a geographical point of view, because geopolitics does not exist, but of course geography does influence um, just, you know, the, the, the Roman Empire boundaries, as you know, are said to be the ones of grapes, because, um, you know, just even through that you could create some substances that were used in order to preserve grain, for example, and uh, just even think about the, the output of the local uh, agriculture due to weather, etc. Say, I don't know, the same parts of Germany where the Romans settled today are basically the ones where you can't cultivate the vineyards. Um, there is literally a, another world. We've seen it very well also in medieval times that this, uh, what was within the empire historically and geographically remained uh, easily a more advanced area throughout the entire Middle Ages, right? The, the more north and east you go, and like the worse it is in terms of development, of population density, of communications, of agricultural output. And this, in fact, left a, a dramatic mark within even modern countries. Right, there are some countries today that are very powerful and rich, but if you actually look at their internal boundaries, they still follow essentially the Roman ones or ones of other dynamics, of course, historically overlapping. That, however, in the first case, are pretty self-evident, right, um, and still create a, a lot of socio-economical divide. Um, the peoples that inhabited beyond those who could be simply seen were not too well known by the Romans. I mean, the Germans were known. Everybody knew who they were. They were sedentaries like the Romans before they put themselves on the march, but they still remained that fundamentally in spite of the injection of nomads. But in fact, w say, beyond the Germans were also other sedentary or semi-nomadic peoples before the the nomads proper. Um, who were these people? Chances are that they knew much better what was happening in the empire in order to harass it because they were desperate to raid, to loot, than the Romans. Right? The Romans ignored um, the existence of most of what we think of European Russia. They just didn't know it was there. I mean, they knew it, but they didn't picture it uh, geographically or culturally or whatever. Well, we have Roman artifacts up to the Urals in a consistent way, so it's obvious that those peoples there knew much better the ex of the existence of the Romans than the Romans thought of those guys. Also, obviously enough, because what is there to think about there um, in the first place? Um, the centrality of Rome uh, is something that rightfully made the same empire thinking of itself in a in this sort of age of in space of order right uh, there is no doubt that Rome was the light that we are obsessed as moderns with the fall of Rome but Rome remained continuously there was not a lag uh, where Rome at some point was not important anymore 
um, the the early medieval papal connection with Britain, with Gaul, with the rest of the West evangelists. It, it's not something that restart, say started from a moment in which everything was raised to the ground. There was no Rome. There was no Roman culture. There was a direct continuity. Uh, even in the darkest times, it's say after the Gothic War, etc., there was never like an end of that. To, of that, right? There, were, there is this genre of videos on YouTube that are obsessed. Again, kids that played Attila Total War, that are obsessed with how Rome was after the fall, as if oh look at how bad it was. Like um, Rome continued to be a very important place by well, it was the largest city in the West, right? Uh, it would be just enough. To, to, but even in terms of population, right? Not just on perimeter, obviously not. What, um, you know, how much of this side instead do you li do you ever listen or see? We are between people to be, to be doomers, to be losers, to be defeatistic, to be pessimistic, to to um, fixate on. The disintegration of civilization, the um, the lack of values, right? What lived in Rome, something that remained always alive, not in the memory of someone, but in the actual and disproportionate um, cultural output throughout the entire Middle Ages from the very beginning um, and from the very end of antiquity. Um, you can't quite uh, unsee that if you're a person with a elementary education uh, even though you know there is no elementary education anymore I understand that um, but this was something among scholars that I don't know it's still somehow obvious at least um, and it always was um, we should ask ourselves why we are fixating with with the contrary of this or with the say archetypal opposite of this an incredibly important concept was the one that the Roman Empire was a single people, conceived as such. Of course, within it, uh, there were many different peoples that had, in fact, also uh, many autonomistic, um, even uh, purposes. But overall, right, it's fair to say that the empire was a a wall standing. Right. Uh, on the other side. Uh, you had only fragmented peoples, right? Uh, they were also constantly warring against one another. And this exemplified the moral cohesion of the empire as a civilization, as opposed to these other populations that were uh, strepitously, um, you know, turbulent because of their lack of internal order. Uh, this, in turn, would produce, of course, uh, as a struggle, the, the aforementioned quality for which the barbarians knew how to fight, etc. But the Roman army could produce, as we've seen, essentially the top-notch military in, in itself. The point is how much the internal cohesion would last, um, especially when these threats were concentrated, when there were avalanches of people. Think about what the Huns do, what the consequences of that... Uh, later exhaustion were for everyone involved uh, the Huns did all this but they dissipated just speaking of the cohesion of peoples um, so after um, the transition of the empire to Christianity the example of the books of Joshua and that of the judges only corroborated and provided this dichotomy with a new sacredness hence the world of the Corrales and the legion where everything can and must be weighed, measured, defined, where everything has a name, a value, a number, everything is clear, everything has a role. Right? Uh, from there, and, but also it's clarifying as such, because that's exactly this rigid control is what characterizes, as you know, the Diocletian's reforms and the Constantinian order, etc. Um, so, but at the same time, that previous order, uh, as long as it still reflected a, a plurality willing to be cohesive, right? Like with the the ancient Roman value. In fact, that, that there was a tribal one. Where it was similar in origin to the one of the same barbarians we're looking at here. 
if not the same actually even though times were different and again that always makes a difference regarding to that the generation of the world that's what i mean um and so but from from the barbaricum this this warming of gog and magog the chaos the nameless horde the fact that these peoples were again unknown you wouldn't know who they were they, they had not they came as a as a threat like as an alter ego almost the dark side of yourself right this infinite distances that are incommensurable just like the one between god and man so the measuring of one's sins to uh falling to this internal as external reflection um in in infinite distances really from um with nothing in between in the barbaricum there weren't cities there weren't major centers there weren't um uh, say the, the closer to civilization again the, the more you could find but what about the steps what about this infinite like space apparently from the roman perspective like uh, only the wild knights um, uh, arising preceded by their herald would look like exactly um, like looking exactly like the one of the apocalypse would uh, would, ar would stand f from there so fear, desolation, this was a, a sentiment that was read very well in the faces of those tribes that pressed on the Roman frontier. The Romans knew that these people were desperated. Um, they knew that what was out there was terrifying. Uh, that it, it really was, like, it, that really reinforced the um, identity pride of being a Roman, right, the, the meaning, the value, the, the valorial cult and um, the, the moral and scientific objectivation of that uh, civilizational divide, right, these peoples wanted to enter, right? their motivation was strong, whereas the Romans were just hoping things would end without, again, making too much effort, as we were saying before, um, and so, uh, these uh, peoples were also bringing with them or imagine the, the communication here the information like they were fleeing chased by something mysterious and terrible that was coming from the east right like and nobody knew exactly what this was i mean imagine how do you track the hunts before they arrived i mean it, it took centuries before they moved across the Eurasian steps corridor but at the same time the question was where you see we there are not satellitary images the the ancient world has a very aside from the Greeks that attempted some uh, reticulate map but they, they just were idealistically content to trace the coordinates but not drawing the map this is what Ptolemy did right the Romans had the itineraria uh, uh, scripta or picta so that there were just a list like from this city I go to this one in that direction and from there to that one so that was their way of measuring the world there were maps um, but they were of course approximated and of course um, based mostly on this sedentary reality what about the outer side how could you ask I don't know a gothic refugee exactly where the hunts were arriving from I mean, as a direction, yes, but I mean, where were they? Where were they at that point? Um, and imagine, just recently, I made a video about the Limitane from the Notizia di Nitatum with the list of all the duchas and the various officers. Well, you may imagine how often and repeatedly these um, uh, would have asked the same question: uh, How many times they will have? made the effort to rationalize to quantify and interpret the answers that they obtained from these peoples right how many times those answers will have been uh, broken sentences in bad latin or perhaps in an idiom that was familiar and say to the maybe romanized soldiers those same uh, ones that had barbarian ancestry but still made more 
guttural and more confused by apprehension, by this malaise, by this sense of sickness, of illness, from having to leave from such a terrible plague. Right? We we realize, by the way, that from the art, the myths, etc., of these peoples, from what we, we can derive uh, from art, archaeology, etc., that they had a much more sinister view of the world, as we were saying before, a much gloomier one, a world dominated by threat, by death, by suffering, right? Um, the Romans, after all, had sort of paradoxically brighter outlook. They could complain, uh, but they perhaps in this sense didn't realize how lucky they actually were. Just like we do not seem to appreciate nowadays either uh, in the West. Um, and so the answers, like they, they will have been lost glances, va vague gestures with the hands dull and obtuse moaning, hunger, tiredness, nameless terror. Uh, a terror that was also spread by the fact that these peoples were literally handing themselves over to the Roman authorities that very often were also quite ready to simply enslave them and to delude, you know, how Adrianople was uh, unfolding. These peoples were essentially trying to cross and they, uh, they were desperate enough for selling their own children in exchange for food and uh, crossing, etc. It was terrifying. So, the, um, the picture is as dramatic as it sounds, again, for everyone involved. And um, it should be, in the sense, much more concretely uh, portrayed when we think about the spirit that is usually one of some sort of glorification of either s struggle. But we forget that this was a moment in which everybody fundamentally lost which everybody uh, say may have also gotten something more than they had before but paid for the price of the entire system to decay and the system was their soul hence this uh, also adequate and necessary reference to it in literature it's not just about Christian authors it's really the, the, the realization that the same Christianity had kicked in because of the failure that mankind was displaying as far as the universal order and um, that's something that I think I would leave you with now in fact for today I stop it here I will surely keep talking about this topics in the future hopefully I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always i thank you heartily for visiting to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time bye